of Computer Science and Director of the Northeast Regional E-Science Center. He's here to speak to us about Carmen. Okay, so this is a project uh, which is a collaboration between computer scientists and neuroscientists. So I should say that I'm actually a computer scientist. So I've picked up some neuroscience along the way, but don't ask me any difficult questions about uh, how the brain works. There's, there's two talk, there's two strands to this talk. So basically there's a, new informatics has been a very challenging sort of science application that we're trying to address. And then there's cloud computing as a particular architectural way of trying to uh, address these, these challenging problems. And the reason we're all involved in this, this collaboration of computer and neuroscience is because we all believe that trying to understand how the brain works is the, is the last great scientific challenge that we, that we have left at the moment that would have huge implications in a number of areas. So not just in neuroscience, but medicine, of course, lots of drugs operate on the brain. Biology, biologists are interested in how the, the brain forms uh, as a result of our DNA. And also computer science. So, uh, trying to understand why the brain's much better at some things than computers are. And uh, surprisingly, there's a very large number of scientists around the world. I was surprised when I saw this figure, 100,000 neuroscientists around the world all working away trying to address these problems. And at the moment, there are a, a lot of problems with the, the way in which neuroscience works. So although it's very expensive to collect the data, and I'll give you an example uh, later on of some very expensive uh, data collection, then the data is very rarely shared. And there are a couple of reasons for this. So uh, the main reason is that when scientists collect data, it's stored in a proprietary format. So they buy some kit from a manufacturer, they do the experiment, the result is stored in some particular file format. They then write analysis routines which are specialized to that sort of file. And so they can't just give that their data to a, another group and may have other analysis routines because the chances are that they wouldn't work with, with their data. And secondly, they, they rarely formally describe the data that they're collecting in a way in which others can use it. So they'll write in the logbook the, 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 uh, the type of experiment that they did and perhaps write down the file name of the, of the data that was collected. But then that's not computationally amenable. So it's not possible for people just to go and grab data, grab the metadata, have a look and under and understand it. And so, although science is supposed to be about uh, reproducibility, then it's very difficult to do this under these, under these circumstances. So there's lots of opportunities lost to, to share data. And, uh, you know, it sounds like I'm criticizing neuroscience. They're actually very clever people, as you can imagine. And, and really, um, this is very common in science. So in the Northeast Regional Science Center, we work with scientists across a lot of domains. And uh, it's, it's very typical. And I came across uh, a guy, Jeff Bowker, who analyzes the way science works. And he has this three-stage standard scientific model. So first of all, scientists collect data, then they publish papers, and then they gradually lose the, <laughs> the original data. And uh, so, so whatever science you look at, this is the way it tends to, tends to work. And so you get all of these sorts of problems. You can't replicate experiments. You can't, re uh, you can't reuse data. And if you look at a paper and you think, I'm not sure I believe these conclusions, you can't go back and get the original data and reanalyze it. So, so this, this is where our project came in. So the idea was calm and to the rescue. So we try to provide a system which allows neuroscientists to share data, but also the codes themselves. Because the criticism I made about data being lost is true of codes. Analysis routines, which are often used by scientists to generate data that you see published, it's very rare that you can get hold of those either. So we're trying to build a system which allows uh, both of these things to be shared by scientists around the world. And um, it's, a, it's quite a large project, as I say, collaboration between computer science scientists and neuroscientists. The work I'm going to talk about, which is mainly on the computing side, is done at uh, Newcastle, where I am, and also at York University. Then we have groups of neuroscientists around the UK who are collecting data and using the system to analyze it. And there's some companies who are supporting us in this. So in the project, there's lots of different types of neuroscience data that, that people work with. And in the project, we're focused on neurophysiological data. So this is where you use typically electrodes, but often now video techniques. And you look at the activity of the individual neurons. So the idea is that you want to try and understand the way in which the brain works. And the, the general feeling is the brain works by using spikes. So spikes are the way in which data is stored, communicated, and processed. 
So you, you use electrodes, you stream the data out from the electrodes, you work out where the spikes are, and you try to understand what those spikes actually mean. And uh, at the bottom, you, if you can uh, crack the neural code, then you get the, the, get the Nobel Prize for doing that. Because at, at the moment, um, really, people only have a fairly vague idea of how the brain works. So I don't know whether you've ever, if you go to a, a university bookstore and you buy a book on neuroscience, they're always about so thick. And uh, uh, if you're like me, you start reading them, and after about an hour, you've learned more about the limitations of your own brain than uh, how, the, how the brain works in general. So you start, to, you start to accelerate, and you go faster and faster through the book for the chapter on how the brain works, and uh, you never find it. And uh, when I talk to my neuroscience colleagues, then they say, well, yeah, I mean, that's the whole idea of these sorts of projects, because we want to write that, that chapter. So it's not, it's, it's not understood at the moment, but they're, they're working on it. So to, to give you a particular example of rare data, which we would like to be able to share and analyze. So um, every month at the local hospital in Newcastle, there are patients who come in who have particular forms of epilepsy, which aren't amenable to to drug treatment, and as a last resort, then surgeons will operate on them. And what they want is to analyze data coming from these patients to work out what parts of the brain to, to remove. Um, and I've got two slides which show an exposed human brain, so a warning at this point. So you can look away, you won't, it won't spoil the flow of the talk, and I'll warn you again in two slides time when it's over. But I just wanted to, to give you an idea. So this is uh, the surgeon's exposed part of the brain where they feel that the, uh, the, the problem tissue, tissue is. And then you can see here's some electrodes which they're using to stream data off to try and understand exactly where the problem is. So you can see uh, two sets of four electrodes there. And to move on, okay, it's safe to, to look again now. Um, you can see, actually that's a bit faint, but you can see the, the, the activity being streamed from those electrodes. You can see the, the spikes, the the, the, the big uh, dips which indicate information being transmitted. So what we'd like to do is to be able to analyze that data as it's coming off the patient to give, them, to give the surgeons a, a, a better idea of where they should be, the way they should be cutting the, the, the brain tissue, and also afterwards to be able to collect this information and make it available to others around the world for analysis. So we end up with a set of requirements from talking to lots of these neuroscientists so we want to share code as well as data. Uh, capacity, so I wrote, I, I've given this slide before and I always write vast data storage, 100 terabytes. When, as this was a Google conference, I did wonder about changing that to pitifully small amounts of data. Um, <laughs> but 100 terabytes seems, uh, seems quite a lot to us. And when you bear in mind that it's not just storing it, you want, actually want to be able to, to analyze it. And a lot of these analysis techniques are very uh, data intensive. So, um, there was somebody in my office uh, last week who had an idea for a, for a routine that he thought would take about half a year to run. And of course, as you build up more and more data uh, in the system, a lot of what these scientists want to do is to do comparisons across whole sets of data for the types of neuroscience they're interested in. So you end up with more and more computation as you get more and more data. Um, the architecture that we, we chose was, was this cloud architecture. So the idea was that we didn't want scientists to have to have lots of software that they deployed on their desk. We didn't want them to keep their, their, their data on their desktop. We wanted to have a out there over the internet somewhere that they could access by through a browser. So the idea is they do the experiments, they upload the data into the, into the cloud, they can use the set of services that are there to analyze it, or they can write their own services and upload those as well and, and use those. Uh, and typical users won't actually upload code, they'll use existing code. But, so typical users will go on there, find data that they're interested in, run the analyses, get some results back, some graphs and visualizations, um, and, and hopefully that will uh, allow them to do their science without having to uh, install lots of software on their desktop. Um, when you look at how you might architect that cloud, then um, there's lots of interest in clouds at the moment, and it tends to be down at that bottom level. So the, the Amazon level, you can pay as you go for, for storage, you can pay as you go for, to run virtual machines. Um, and so we could, we could have said to people, okay, that's it. You, we give you storage and, uh, uh, and compute, and you can do whatever you want with it. But um, as I've said, we've had this regionally science center. It's been running since 2001. And we've worked on, I think it's about 25 different research projects with probably about 10 different sorts of scientists. And over time, you gradually get a picture for what are the key services that you need in order to build a science cloud. So 
what we decided to do was try to build scalable implementations of these key services so that we could get the users worrying at a much higher level so they could rely on uh, useful services in order to do their science. So we rejected that and went for this. And this is the set of initial services that we, that we came up with. So this is what we built for the Kalman project. Um, for each one of them, we tried to make them scalable. Um, in this talk, because of the, the time pressure, I'm only going to talk about a couple of these services and how we scale them. But I'll, I'll go through them all quickly now. So obviously, the um, key thing is to be able to store data. The primary data tends to be files. So we store that in a file system. In fact, we use this storage resource broker from San Diego, which some of you will uh, probably know. Um, and because the key thing, as I've said, is that it's possible for other people to share to share these files, we need some way so that they can interpret them, so they know what data is in them. So in our system, when you upload a file, you also have to fill in a form where you describe metadata. So it talks about what the experiment was, what part of the brain it was operating on, what drugs were being used, and so on. So this is stored in that uh, metadata uh, repository, which you can see there on the, on the right-hand side. And that means we can have a registry down on the left -hand, bottom left there, so that people can search for data and act actually also codes that they're interested in. Um, so a typical scenario for a neuroscientist would be to search for a particular sort of data and then run some analysis routines across it. Um, we've got a workflow enactment engine. So workflow has been very popular for e-science. A lot of people like that as a way of combining together, composing different services, and also to visually represent what they, what they do. It's much easier to show a fellow scientist a workflow, a graphical representation of a workflow, than it is to show them uh, 3,000 lines of Fortran or or Java or whatever. So, so we have a workflow enactment engine uh, in there to, to run workflows. Um, OK, and then we've got a security uh, infrastructure. So if you say to scientists, OK, we've, we've got lots of disks. We've got a way in which you can share your data. Just upload it, and anybody in the world can, can see it. Then they won't do it. So, uh, and the reason is because of the reward structure in science, where you get your reward not for collecting data, but actually for analyzing the data and writing papers about it. So you need to provide a fairly sophisticated, fine-grained security system, which allows scientists to control. So initially, they can look at the data and control it themselves. Then they can open it up to their collaborators. And then finally, once they've got the, the papers out and they're comfortable with making it available, they can make it available publicly to anybody. So we, we have to provide a security system which, uh, which allows that. OK, so um, what I'll what I'll do now is I'll focus on a couple of these services. So I'll talk first of about the service repository, which you can see at the bottom right. So um, as I've said, we wanted a way to share codes as well as data. And so that's where we've got this, uh, this service repository. And we use this system that we've had for a few years, which we call Dinosaur, which gives us a code repository and dynamic deployment. So users upload their data. The stipulation that we have, so we have to have some a uh, common way to represent the, these codes is that they have to be wrapped as web services. So we stick to very simple web services, WSI web services for interoperability. And uh, the advantage of this is that the internals aren't important. So different, scient different scientists uh, come along with different sorts of codes. MATLAB's very popular for, um, for neuroscientists, for example, but they also write in Java, in R, C, C sharp, and so on. Um, and what we do then is, so they, so they upload their services, and we then provide deployers. So for each different type of service, so for example, for Tomcat services, uh, they upload .war files. And we've got deployers so that dynamically we can take services from this repository and deploy them on available compute resources as they are needed. Um, one of the, as well as the .war files, one of the main ones that we've, we start to use more and more is virtual machines. So we can wrap these um, we can wrap these services in VMware virtual machines, put them in the repository, and that's what's deployed. And that's important because you often find that scientists have very uh, sophisticated requirements for the environment in which the service runs. So they need particular sorts of libraries. Sometimes they even need a particular version of the operating system. So virtual machines gives them a way to, to encapsulate their environment so that it, uh, it can be dynamically deployed. So this is a, an animation for, for how uh, Dinosaur works. So you can see at the top there the service repository. So that's where the, the services are uploaded into. And um, it's on the left hand side you can see the, the client, and the client's going to send a sort message to an endpoint at the web service provider. So as far as the client's concerned, 
It doesn't know anything about dynamic deployment or dinosaur. It's just an endpoint that it can send a SOAP message to if it wants to use a service. Um, so it does that. And when the SOAP message arrives at that endpoint, what the web service provider does is it has information about where there is a repository with a deployable version of that service contained in it. So it inserts in the header of the SOAP message a reference to that repository. So basically, once you've got to this stage now, then effectively that SOAP message is, a, is like a closure in a functional program language because you've got, the, you've got the data, you've got the body of the message, and you've also got to point it to the, to the code which you can use to process that message. So then the web service provider sends the message to uh, what we call host provider. So host provider can be a, uh, any, anywhere where you've got some compute resources where you can deploy services and process messages. So it could be a cloud. You could have multiple host providers. You can make dynamic decisions based on cost or on performance about where to route it. So in this case, this is a request for a service S4. And S4 isn't deployed on any of the nodes at this host provider at the moment, but that's okay because there is that link in the header to the service repository. So the, the host provider sends a request, a deployable version of the service comes back, gets installed on a node, and the SOAP message can be processed and returned. Um, so it's quite... Um, so, so this system, once that, once, that, um, once that software is deployed, then it can stay there. So, and subsequent accesses to that service, you don't have to deploy every time. So you, effectively, you, you divide up the cost of deploying the service across all of the, the accesses which you, you have to that service. And uh, we see this is in contrast to job scheduling, for example, which is quite common in uh, e-science. But there, every time you, you submit a job to the system, you're moving around the the, the, the code as well as the data. With this sort of system where you can dynamically deploy a service, once it's deployed, it can remain there. Um, and you don't, yeah, so as I've said, you don't pay that cost once the service is deployed. This is a request for service S2. So it comes to the host provider, and S2 is already deployed down at that bottom node. And then, so it's just processed, just like any other web service request. Um, we also use Dinosaur for scalability. So, um, one of the things you can do is, what, because you've got this deployable version of the service, you can assume it's a stateless service. You can deploy multiple versions of that service, and then you can schedule requests around different uh, deployments of that service in order to get scalability. And we've played with various algorithms, so you could deploy automatically a service to every node in a pool. We've also tried some uh, adaptive techniques. So here's, here's one algorithm that, we, that we've used. So um, if you look at the at the graph along the, the x-axis, that's the arrival rate of messages for a particular service. And if you look at the, the left-hand y-axis, this is the response time, and that's plotted on the, the lower graph, the one with the, the diamond markers. And you can see what's happening here, that um, the response time's fairly flat, and then once you get up to about uh, uh, arrival rate of about half a message a second, then suddenly the, the response, uh, response time increases. And you can see what's happening by looking at the other graph, the one at the the top with the, uh, with the square markers and the, the right-hand y-axis, because what's happening is the system's noticing that the request rate is increasing, and um, as it does so, it, it worries about the, the response uh, time. It measures that, and in order to try to keep that constant, it starts to dynamically deploy the service on multiple nodes. So you can see initially it started with it on two nodes, and it goes up to four and six and 10 and 12 and so on, until it gets up to 16, and in fact, um, 16 nodes isn't enough to cope with an arrival rate of, uh, well, one message a second for this particular service. So that's why the response time is increasing. But if we had more nodes in this experiment, then we could keep that response time flat for, for longer. So by having deployable versions of service and the ability to dynamically deploy them, it gives you this capability to, to scale services as they become popular, as they become used more, more and more. OK, the second. Um, part of the system I'll look at and think about uh, scalability is a part which users often use when they've first uploaded data. So what they're, what they're interested in is having a look at the, the, the data and just to check that it's okay before they run a workflow on it to do the analysis. So they, they're looking to see whether there are spikes in it and whether the spikes are at the, at the right sort of places. So this is a, a tool produced by uh, my colleagues in York and uh, they've got a company there, Cybula. And this gives you a, an interactive way to look for, uh, to look at the, the information coming from a set of electrodes. So you can see each of those, 
those graphs in the, the right-hand side of that panel are from different electrodes in a multi-electrode array. And you can search for particular uh, features, so you can draw them by hand if you want to, or you can find one and say, find more that are like this. And then you, 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 you tell the system to do that. It goes off and locates data which is stored in the Kalman system, which meets that criteria. So um, what we do for this, they've got a system called Aura. And when the, uh, the user presses the, the search button, then this sends off a, a request. And what it does is to parallelize the request. So everywhere where you've got your data, which could be uh, in multiple nodes in a, in a cluster or across even across uh, different, different clouds, then there's a, there's a component called a pattern matching control. And this receives the, the request, and it pushes it down to agents which run close to the disks on which the data is held. So the idea is to try to avoid uh, transferring data uh, across distance. So you move the, the, the pattern matching as close as you can to the data. And so um, the, the search happens in parallel, and then eventually the, the results come back. And at any time in this process, the client can start to explore the, the data. So you can look at the patterns that have been found and look at the, the data around it. And uh, this is a generic uh, system for scalable pattern matching. So um, the, 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 my colleagues at York use it for things like facial recognition, for looking at stresses in aero engines, as well as exploring uh, neuroscience data. And you can plug in your own particular search techniques. So the one that, uh, that we've used uh, in, in these experiments is uh, correlation mat uh, uh, matrix <coughs> memories, which is a, a neural network type of technique which, which scales particularly well across large data sets. Uh, okay, just to bring everything together at the, uh, towards the end of the talk. So this is one of the workflows which um, uh, the, the scientists have, have used. So this represents something that's quite typical where they get some original data, they run some code which happens to be an R, an R service which does some statistical analysis, and then they produce various sorts of uh, graphs and movies. And in fact, I'll, uh, ah, so, so this is just showing, um, so this shows two things. So this shows our portal. So I said that we had a cloud um, solution and what we wanted was for users just to use a browser on their desktop rather than have to install software. So this is the, the portal that they use to, uh, to do that. And you can see the, the, the user's data that they have access to on the left-hand side and split by uh, location and then particular uh, laboratories and then particular experiments that have been called. Then they can select existing workflows or they can write their own workflows. And they can right-click on a workflow to run it on the particular data that they've, they've selected. And uh, when they do that, well, there's a movie on the next slide. The, the other thing that we can learn from this is that uh, we aren't particularly talented at doing user interfaces. So we've, um, uh, we are actually uh, getting some people involved to make this uh, uh, prettier and more usable. But uh, you get the, the idea. So this is, for example, a typical output that the neuroscientists want from one of these workflows. And uh, each of the uh, points on the grid represents a, an electrode, an electrode array. And what they do is they they visualize the amount of activity by the, the radius of the, of the circles you can see. So this is, um, rather than just present the scientists with a, with a table of numbers, this is a good way for them to uh, be able to visualize the, the waves of activity sweeping across some neurons in a, in a part of the brain. OK, so to, to finish, uh, so I'll give some conclusion, talk about uh, directions where this is, where this is going. So, um, so the idea here is to deliver not just a cloud for neuroscience, but a, a, a scalable science cloud that we can use across all the different sorts of scientists, uh, sciences that we, that, we work, that we work on. And so what we've, had, what we've done is to try and identify what these key services are and then try to produce scalable implementations of them. Um, we've just got funding to look at trying to extend this across to universities and industries across the the northeast of England in a project called eScience Central. And so we're building up now, as well as the, we've got the neuroscience services, we're building up uh, services for other sciences, for example, chemical informatics. There's lots of small chem chemical informatics companies across the northeast of England. At the moment, if you want to do chemical informatics, you have to buy uh, some kit, you have to buy the software that runs on it, you have to employ somebody to look after that. So we're trying to see whether it would be possible to replace that with something where people could just open up a web browser and have access to to those services that they needed to use without them having to uh, buy hardware or software or to manage it themselves. Um, a key problem here, though, is, is sustainability. So um, 
uh, one of the reasons I was interested in coming to here was to hear about what commercial companies are doing about, about clouds. So um, there's a high cost in managing and maintaining all the software and hardware that, that we need. And uh, academics like, like, like uh, those in the project we're funded to do research, not, not run a service. And so we have to worry because we, we build these systems, we encourage scientists to upload their data to it, and our funding runs out in uh, a couple of years' time and, and what happens then. So we have to put a lot of effort into thinking about uh, sustainability. So we've been looking at commercial clouds, um, and the, the attraction there is the, the pay-as-you-go for, for storage and processing. So even after the end of the project, if we could cobble together some money so that we could afford to to, to pay to, to maintain the, the, the data and the processing, then that, that gives us a, a vehicle for sustainability. And um, we've been looking at uh, technologies such as there's a, there's a company that I do some work with, Arjuna, and they provide uh, technology which gives you a, a way of moving from private clouds, such as the one that we've got at the moment, so we run that on our own cluster, to external clouds such as, such as Amazon, so you can transfer data according to... Uh, data and, and, and work according to some policy. So it doesn't have to be a big bank switch. You can do it in, in stages. Um, but this still leaves, of course, a, a hole because, um, so if you look at what say, Amazon would give us, pick one of those vendors, it would give us that bit at the bottom with the storage and, and compute. And then you've got the, the particular services to which we, we argue you need in order to support science, and then the specific science applications at the top. And so there's still this issue about how do you support these, these services. So one of the things I'm interested in is whether over the, the coming years there'll be an emergence of more domain-specific clouds where companies will provide uh, not just storage and compute, but specific services for particular domains. And so we've started to, oops, gone the wrong way. We started to, to look at this through a company called uh, Inkspot Science. So to have a look at the, uh, the possibility of, of, of providing a a system, a science cloud for, for users on a subscription or a pay-as-you-go basis. So that's, that's the way we're looking at the future. Okay, thank you.